TV presents Monica Pearson, one-on-one. He's Atlanta's homegrown radio personality. Ryan Cameron is the voice of Atlanta. He trademarked the title given to him by Atlanta Magazine. He's won two local Emmy Awards, been nominated for two National Association of Broadcasters Marconi Radio Awards, and he's in the Georgia Radio Hall of Fame. <laughs> Better me for you to ask priests. Ryan Cameron is now into hats, and that's why he wanted me to meet him at Fruition on Murphy Avenue near Atlanta's West End. So why wearing hats now? Why are you into hats now? Because I got to, you know, when you go from the, I mean, after a certain age, you, you get past the baseball cap era. Um, then you got to try to figure out something. As my therapist said, Ryan, you must realize that you are now a middle-aged man. So how has your therapy changed you? My therapy has, I, I feel like I'm a different man now. How? Because, you know, they talk about childhood trauma and what happens to you when you're younger. Like when I was, you know, very young, I had my eye accident where I was just, I was from an abusive relationship. I was afraid to come out of my room because my mother was in a relationship with a guy who hated the fact that she had a son. And so when I came back to live with my mother, he despised me. So every chance he could get, he did something to me, bullied me, pushed me around. So I had the chicken pox and I was afraid to come out of the room to watch TV. Cause I, you know, I remember the worst thing that would happen to me, Monica is, my mother would let him drive her car, which means that he would come back home and I would just be cringing, waiting to see what was gonna happen. And so I was in the uh, in my room, cause we didn't have a television in the room and I was playing with a ruler and shooting down toy soldiers, you know, with a rubber band. And I came back and I, just like I'm sitting on the stool, I sat on the ruler and it cracked. So when I pulled it back to shoot it down, the ruler came back and it hit me in the eye. So then, you know, you, you get something in your eyes that you shake, but it was black and yellow. So I knew, I knew something was wrong, but he was in the shower. So I said, here, yeah, I gotta go and I gotta get this man who despises me and tell him something's wrong. And so I go from that, I get him, he calls my mother and I'm in surgery like an hour later and developed like two cataracts. And this is, I mean, this is way back in the day. So, you know, they say sometimes with trauma, you're kind of parked at that age. Mm -hmm. So I'm like 11, you know, 10. So it was kind of like I had an arrested development and I felt like my development had uh, been arrested and it took me a long time to, to go back in and realize how that affected me, how it affected my relationships. And going back and, and talking about that kind of helped me start to where I am today. But you know, even as a kid kid, even younger, you had a um, speech impediment. Yeah. And now you're in a business. <laughs> I, I know, it, it's, it, it's funny because when I was uh, at Collier Heights Elementary School, they had a group of us and we all had speech impediments. So it was Wyan or Wawa or something like that. So they took like eight of us um, to Clark Atlanta University and they did what is basically hooked on phonics. And so for six weeks, they did all these, you know, cards and letters or whatever. But at the end of it, they played the before and after on CAU, uh, WCLK radio. So this is what the kids sounded like then, and this is what they sound like now. And, and now, and the first time I heard myself in my grandfather's living room with those headphones on, I heard myself on the radio, I was like, that's it. That's what I'm not, so I mean, to go from a speech impediment to a Hall of Fame career, is, um, it's just God. Man. Ryan was raised mostly by his grandmother in Southwest Atlanta, Bankhead, until his mom moved him to Smyrna. I had never seen a white person except on TV. Really? <laughs> Cause I'm living on Bankhead. The only time we saw white people was when they came down the street to try to sell us insurance. You know, there was always a white man that would come down and be like, oh, where your mom at? Mr. White man. She not here. <laughs> Tell him I'm not here. Tell him I'm not here. <laughs> she said she's not here. And that was the only time we would see him. So to go from that to inside East Cobb Middle School was culture shock. I understand that one student was wearing a shirt that was really negative about people of color. Yeah. And you went to the teacher right. to point it out. Yeah. She, um, I, in the lunch line and, um, 
the shirt said, uh, if God wanted N-words to ride Harley Davidson's, he wouldn't have made Hondas. And he was talking about motorcycles. And I was like, oh my God. And I went and told, and then the teacher was like, it's just a t-shirt. And I was like, okay, this is gonna be an issue. Now, is that when you started using humor to get you out of situations that were well, see, uncomfortable? A lot of people don't understand this. And I gotta say, I, I wanna make sure that people understand, like, two white teachers, Ms. Gunderson and Ms. Smith, they were the ones who encouraged me to be innovative and, and outgoing. And they would let me cut up at the end of the week if I behaved during the week. So they were like, okay, just calm it down. We don't know, you know, we didn't know it was ADHD then. then calm it down, Mr. Hyperactive. If you can wait till Friday, when we're doing current events, we'll let you do your thing. And that's kind of how it got started. So I always give them credit for, you know, and, and coming from a class where there was only 14 black people in my, in my senior class. Uh, out of 300 people. Well, you were the first black president at your school, Campbell right. High School. Mm -hmm. But then you were reminded of your blackness when your Honda was destroyed. Oh my God. I, you know, my, 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 my uncle got me a, a, a Honda MB5 and I used to ride it to school with my ROTC uniform on. And I was so happy, man. I was like, man, I don't never have to catch the bus again because I was always late. And my mother would call and she'd be like, you know, she, your mother calls and the phone rings and she calls again and she said, you better not miss that bus. And once I got that motorcycle, I was like, oh, you know what? I can just ride to school and park it. So I go outside one day and I'm looking for it and it's gone. And we go, there's a ravine where we live off a cliff probably more construction there that they might have built some more apartments or something but there's a ravine and it's at the it's at the bottom like somebody's thrown it off uh, deliberately and and cut up the seats and it was right after I had won the election and the message was don't think you all that <laughs> don't think you all that Ryan and he says he got that same feeling again when he was dropped after 20 years, the last 17, as the announcer of the Hawks basketball team. This is the first time I've ever talked about this because I just felt like it was 20 years of rooting for the team and, 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 and making them understand how much we loved them. In 2001, Ryan joined the Hawks to do contests with fans between plays. Then in 2004, he became the first black person to be the on-court announcer. Back then, the Hawks were losing games and attendance. Ryan was their biggest fan and cheerleader. So good at hyping up the crowd, he became part of a video game. But after 20 years, Ryan lost his job. It was a business decision, according to the team. Ryan no longer works for the company, Odyssey, that broadcasts the Hawks games. But Ryan says it was personal and started when he was advised to ask for payment for recording robocalls for the multi-billion dollar redevelopment of the Gulch in downtown Atlanta. I went to the person and I said, hey, this is what I want. And about 10 minutes later, my phone rang and it was an executive and he read me up and down six ways to Sunday. How dare you? I can't believe that you're asking for money. When we come back, how Ryan is coping with rejection, not only from his loss with the Hawks, but in his love life too. So we went from the greatest relationship for almost a year to broken up after I proposed. Over a ring? Metro 75, The Real Sound, Atlanta, Ryan Cameron, Uncensored, Neo. Ryan Cameron keeps busy as the afternoon jock on Magic 107.5, but he's still processing his firing by the Hawks. He has tickets, but has not been to one game. You know what my, my therapist said? And it's always when you have somebody that kind of reins you back in. She said, Ryan, for 42 nights a year, you let that affect anniversaries, birthdays, vacations, anything you wanted to do had to be dependent on when that schedule came out. You better not have nothing going on on New Year's Eve if they got a game on December 31st. You better not have nothing on Christmas Eve. She said, 
You would have kept walking in that building after 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years. You would have never left. Now, was she wrong? No, she wasn't. So I got 42 nights back and I got my life back, but am I still passionate about Atlanta sports? You better believe it. You know, I thought if they wanted to do something, they could have said, you know what? We'll take you out of the first chair. But in case there's an emergency or this person goes on vacation, I missed two games in 20 years. Two in 20 years. Do you know how much effect that had on my life, my marriage, my children? Because I was so dedicated to that game and to just be like, and I think one of the quotes was, you know, uh, like the Godfather, they, they said, it's just business. That's not business. That's intentional. You intended to teach me a lesson. And now Ryan has learned another hard lesson. This one is about relationships. Ryan was married 16 years, has three children, and been divorced five years. What will it take to have another Mrs. Ryan Cam? I dated, I used a dating service. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a very prestigious, I paid. This isn't like Tinder or Bumble or whatever. And they found me a woman and I dated her for almost a year. And I said, I'm gonna marry this woman. And I flew down to her parents' house. I rented a car and I drove to her mother's house and told her, I wanna marry your daughter. I want her to be my wife. And she said, oh my God, I can't believe this. It's gonna be incredible. But I had two rings, because I haven't proposed to anybody in 22 years, Monica. So I didn't know, you know, I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to just, I want to, you know, have this kind of ring and that kind of ring. And so I said, well, which one should I give her? And she said, I don't know, just let her choose. So I go back and I propose. I get out on one knee and I propose. After 11 and a half months, this is it. I'm out of the game. She says yes. And she wakes up the next day. She says, I can't believe I'm engaged. I say, you are. And then the next day comes and she calls me. She says, we need to talk. And for any guy that's listening in, it's the worst text you can ever receive from a woman. We need to talk. And then I go, talk about what? And she says, we just need to talk. So I get there that night and she talks about the ring and that the ring was not fancy enough. What? It wasn't good enough. It wasn't, it, it did not show how I felt about her. No. And I said, so forget all this about me wanting to marry you and spend the rest of my life with you but it's about the ring? And she said, yeah, I thought about it. It's, it's about the ring. I said, well, you know, and I talked about, I had like intense therapy says, bam, 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 you wanna meet today? Yes, meet tomorrow, yes, yes, I meet, meet, meet. And she said, Ryan, if a person doesn't believe that it's you, they're not choosing you, the ring has nothing to do, do with, with it. it. So we went from the greatest relationship for almost a year to broken up after I proposed. Over a ring? Over a ring. That is her loss. One thing that is not lost on Ryan is his need to give back to the community. There is the 20-year-old Ryan Cameron Foundation that is a little different from most. So I said, if I start a foundation, I'm not gonna have it be based on grade point averages. It's gonna be based on interviews and effort. If you're gonna prepare yourself, if you want this money, if you want this college scholarship, if you want this book stipend, you gotta come back and keep giving back like my grandmother made me give back. It's all about the give back, not about the academics. When we return, why his father-daughter dance is healing, and I'll introduce you to Bert Weiss, who is a hit with women listeners and is probably the envy of every other radio personality in town. We don't try to hide too much, and we try to be as vulnerable and honest as we can be, and Life is messy, and I think people understand that. We just want them to know how to be treated by a guy. So whether it's, you know, opening a door or pulling out a chair or showing them how to uh, be respected as young ladies. Hi. <laughs> the father-daughter dance is 24 years old. I started the dance when Ryan Megan, my oldest, was four. 
because I just loved the way that all the daughters dressed up and were like princesses or whatever. But then it's evolved into anybody with a father, be it in their 30s, 40s, whatever, people flying in from other countries to be at the dance. And, and so we can't wait till 2023 to bring it back because I always tell people, it doesn't matter if your, your relationship is great, if you have none, this is strange, if it's broken, that dance mends people's hearts. It, it brings, it's the dad who, who knows, forget what's going on with the, the other you know, parent or whatever, the drama. Because we're, we're our daughters, we're the first banker, we're the first confidant, we're the first person that they really, really male, that they really fall in love with. So we have a place in their hearts that is beyond anything else. So we can fix that or mend it or make it right. And then we got some great dessert. It's all good. My next guest also believes in making children's dreams come true through his charity, Bert's Big Adventure. Bert Weiss is an anomaly in radio. He's been at the same station 20 years, owns his own show, is syndicated, and is number two in morning radio ratings behind a news station. And he's number one in the morning with women. Time to go one-on-one -on -one with Bert Weiss. It was a pretty extensive list. And in 90 minutes, you guys cleared this teacher's list. 90 minutes. Over 21 years, sidekicks have changed. Even the radio frequency has changed from Q100 to 99.7. But one thing has not changed. Bert Weiss headlining The Bert Show. Well, when I thought about interviewing you today, I really realized that Bert's big adventure Although it is your nonprofit charity, mm -hmm. it could also be you in terms of radio. It has been a big adventure. It really has. Yeah. Um, I was not expecting any of this. None of it. Um, when I took the job in Atlanta, Monica, I tell you, I had to get on anxiety meds because I was co hosting, actually, I was a sidekick and a producer on other shows. So I really felt like this was my only shot. And we literally had, it was a brand new signal. Uh, it was a Q100 back in the day. It was a brand new signal. We had zero listeners. I mean, literally, it was a brand new signal. So I remember being so stressed out and the fear of failure was so debilitating. I had to go on anxiety meds. Um, and it was a really great time back then. I mean, we're talking 21 years ago now, right? Uh, when I was 12, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, 21 years ago. And it was such, an amazing and liberating and free time. Because when you have zero listeners when you start, there is nowhere to go but up. So we'd find out we had three listeners and we were high-fiving each other in the halls. This is the greatest. We just tripled our listenership. Um, and my program director at the time, a guy named Brian Phillips, really eased my mind, which doesn't happen in radio, and probably not in TV anymore either. I remember going into his office after about two weeks and going, man, you hired the wrong guy. I don't know what I'm doing. I thought I was ready, but I am not ready. And I remember him saying, look, um, go in and do the show that you've always wanted to do. And we'll circle back in, let's say, six weeks. And we'll try to figure out what you've been doing right and what you've been doing wrong. But until then, don't worry about it. Go in there and sound terrible. So I've been sounding terrible for 21 years. We never had that talk. Uh, but he took that stress away, that pressure of trying to be good. And I really believe that's what launched this whole thing. Let's keep that energy today. We'll highlight another teacher after Entertainment Buzz. Well, you know, you are an anomaly when it comes to radio. First of all, on the air for 21 years in the same city. Yeah. That's, that's an anomaly. Yep. Then the fact that you own, you own yeah. your show. Yeah. Yeah, that was important. That was important. How did you do that? It was a contract year, and I just threw it out there, and they went for it. <laughs> um, I, I, I tell you, it, you know, when you've been doing this for a while, you know this also, like, it is really not a lot of fun to work for other people. Um, and you, you built up a certain amount of credibility, 
in the industry and I just wanted to own my own thing. I wanted to be my own boss. And if I was gonna go into other radio stations, I wanted to listen to what everybody said, but I wanted inevitably to be able to make my own decisions. So I turned it into my own, it's a Burt Show LLC, and it's our own show, and we contracted out to all these radio stations around the country, but yeah. 25 stations 25 now. stations, you know more about this than I do. But I could wake up tomorrow and it could be 23 and I wouldn't know until listeners start calling. Like, I've had calls in the morning, Tupelo calling, going, are you guys not on the radio anymore? And then I'll call the Tupelo radio station in the front desk and they're like, yeah, we canceled you three days ago. <laughs> so it could be 25 today, it could be 23 in a couple of days. Any trip I took, I tried to prepare for every situation. Man. The fact that you have the longevity and you own it and you're syndicated makes you stand out above everybody else. Plus, when you look at ratings, the only person who beats you normally is Scott Slade on WSB, and that is news. And when it comes to women, 20, I think 25 to 54, you're number one always. What's the magic sauce? You have been seeing this on Twitter quite a bit, on different social media, where teachers are now like, hey, you guys, the school year's right ahead of me, and I could really use some help. Um, well, I don't like the fact that Scott's still beating me. <laughs> so I'm very competitive. Um, I'll tell you, the syndication started out of defense more than it did offense. I didn't want to be this guy that was on 10 stations, 12 stations, 25 stations, and it still doesn't matter to me. But radio was going through a time where they were making so many cuts. And I took a, lot, a look around at my staff, and we had a lot of staff, and I didn't want them to have the option to go, look, you just got too many people, so we gotta start making cuts. So I threw it out to them saying, look, you know what, I do got a lot of staff. If you wanna put me on in uh, Nashville or in Charleston, you go and do your own thing. And it really was out of defense, I just wanted to keep my staff. And then once they gave me a station, I'm like, hey, I can make some cash off this. So that's when we started syndicating more and more and more. Then it became offensive. When you're being like interviewed by an icon, there's something very intimidating about that. And now you have Pioneer. Yeah. And you're doing podcasting. Yeah. Your show alone, just the Burt Show alone, you get like what? Four million people downloading it a month? A month, yeah, it's about one million a week now. I'm crying at the thought <laughs> of a flight attendant giving Simone Biles, the most decorated gymnast in history, a coloring book because she is 4'8". We've got a really great team and, you know, radio has been really, really great to me, but I can see that, you know, we're sort of evolving into this podcasting era and I'm not gonna be doing radio forever. I'm not gonna be on the radio at 75 years old talking about the Kardashians. I am not going to be on the radio at 75 talking about the Kardashians. It sounds um, like you really haven't made up your mind, uh, Bert. Uh, I really have made up my mind. Um, so I'm starting to like look into podcasting and other ways that podcasting can help radio. Radio can help podcasting and we can be influencers for each other. And Pioneer really is a network built on that. So we're kind of in the baby steps right now, but that's going to be the next step, I think. Up next, Bert shares with us the secret to his success. Plus, he opens up about the difficult relationship with his father and how that led to his proudest accomplishment. Bert currently co-hosts with Kristen Klingshorn and Mo Mitchell. There have been other sidekicks in the past, and personnel changes haven't drastically changed the ratings. And I don't know what this means, but The Rock will be Shark Week's first ever Master of Ceremonies. <laughs> you know, I asked you what was your secret sauce. You're just open about anything and everything. Yeah, we, we try to be. Um, I think that listeners that have been listening from the beginning have sort of grown with us. Um, they kind of lived through Stacy and I having our kids because they had kids at the same time. Um, and we've been talking about the same sort of problems that are going on in their life also. Look, I was very open about talking about my divorce on the show also. Now I'm getting remarried and I talked about my new relationship also. So I think there's something to that. We don't try to hide too much and we try to be as vulnerable and honest as we can be. And life is messy and I think people understand that and there was a time I think when we got to Atlanta that radio was really a lot of bells and whistles and pranks and stuff like that and I think that we came in at a time where 
the American public um, was just ready for something a little bit more real. And we just, I just hired a bunch of people. We didn't know what we were doing. And we went on there and we said that we don't know what we're doing. And it's sort of been the same formula ever since. Reality radio. Kinda, yeah, <laughs> kinda. Is there anything you all won't talk about? Oh yeah. Like what? Um. Well, I, I don't like to talk about my sex life too much. That's kind of off the table. Um, there are certain personnel issues behind the scenes that I don't like to create family drama within the studio. Um, but yeah, I think we all have our limitations on things that we can and cannot talk about. Uh, I've been doing it a little bit longer than some of the people on the show. So it's trial and error for a lot of virtual members because we sort of demand, like if you're gonna be on the show, you gotta talk about your personal life. So they're experimenting with what they can and can't talk about, but by the time they talk about it and they get home, it's too late. <laughs> the fight has already started. Great radio, bad personal life. Even though you don't realize it, and your mind's like, no, nah, I'm good, your body needs this hug. It needs it. Hug it out, All right. hug it out, hug it out. Well, you've said before in interviews that you don't like being the boss. I don't. Um, <clears throat> I actually hate it. I just took this quiz a couple of days ago. It's funny. Um, <clears throat> and it ranks what your strengths are. And leadership came in third out of like four categories. <laughs> You're, uh, no, that's a joke. No, 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 no. That's serious. Yeah, I have. Um, if I had to do it all over again, Monica, I would have hired somebody to... I don't know, that would have sort of been the boss of the Burt Show rather than me kind of assuming that role. It's very difficult to do when you're trying to manage people and also do a show with them. Um, it was impossible actually. And uh, I, I, I don't like that. I like coming in and having a great time uh, and laughing, talking about things that matter, but trying to manage people, it just takes a lot of chess work and psychology and it's exhausting to me. I'm, I, and you're I, also very sensitive. I am, and yeah, I, I am. Um, and good leaders probably can't have that gear when they're in the office. Uh, and I do take things personally. And when things go wrong, um, I try to figure out how, I, I take a lot of responsibility, so when things don't go right, I try to figure out what I did to get us there. But that has been, by far, I'd say the most exhausting part of the job for me is trying to lead. That's just not my natural place. And but God, the control I want I just felt like if this isn't gonna work, I wanna be the one to make sure that it either works or it doesn't work. So I took that on and I never gave it up and that was a mistake. One mistake he was determined not to make. He was going to be a good father to his sons and not like his father. We really had a very, very difficult relationship. He came from a very hard-nosed father himself. Uh, he was very uh, dismissive. He was just a hard, hard guy. And we were never, never close. My mom was sort of the same way. So. Um, when Hayden was born, I realized that I sort of had the same disconnection with Hayden that I felt that I learned from my parents. And at that point I said, this is not gonna be passed down to my kids. So I went heavy deep into therapy uh, for years, uh, trying to get that connecting gene and trying to figure out how to parent on my own way. And you know, as I, as I sit here today, I, I, I can tell you it's the thing that I'm most proud of in my life because it took a lot of work. It was literally reprogramming everything that I knew about being a parent uh, and everything I knew about relationships also. It took a lot of hard work, but now I'm very proud of the parent I am. When we return, Bert talks about reconciling with his father, proposing twice to his now fiance, and why Bert's big adventure is so important. Then later in the show, comedian Myra J tells us how she went from a social worker to comedian after a blind date. That was on Saturday. 48 hours later, I went on stage for the first time ever to perform comedy. Bert is so proud of the father, he's become to sons Hayden and Hollis, thanks to therapy. And he's glad his father got to see it. Their path to reconciliation started with a phone call. Uh, he was out in Arizona. <clears throat> I didn't even know what his situation was really, but I got a call from his wife at the time. I didn't even know he was married, saying, I just want to let you know I'm leaving your dad. And he had nobody else. He literally uh, it disconnected himself from everybody. So I flew out of there more of obligation than connection. And he was in bad shape. And I just thought, you know what? 
he's got nobody else. So I bring him out to Atlanta and uh, for six months, I put him in a retirement home and we got really close in that six months. It, it's really like right out of a movie, uh, super close. I learned more about him in six months than I had my entire life. And just before he passed away, um, I took him to the beach because his favorite thing to do was go to the beach and he was in his wheelchair and I wheeled him on down uh, onto the beach. He watched the sunset. That was kind of his last wish. And I brought him back home and he said to me, uh, you've become the man that I never could. Oh. And uh, that was the greatest gift that he ever gave me. It was in his last couple of days, but it was a pretty tremendous gift. Bert's gift to the community is his nonprofit, Bert's Big Adventure. Children who are chronically or terminally ill and their families are treated to a week at Disney World all expenses paid. So far, 257 families have benefited over 20 years. Yeah, it's, um, it really is magical because one of the requirements for the families is that this has to be their first trip to Disney World. So catching that magic for the very first time. And you gotta remember also that these are kids and families that just don't have a lot of time to spend with each other. There's no such thing as a schedule. Um, in a lot of cases, there's no such thing as a vacation. So to see them run through the park and experience all the Thing, these special things that they might have seen on TV, but also do it in a family of other kids that are just like them. Monica, what we see a lot is, you know, our special needs kids feel like they're on the outside looking in. And when we get into Disney World and we've got 13 kids and we've got 72 members and we're the ones that are going through the park together, people are looking at us with envious eyes. And this might be the first time that these kids have been looked at like that. <laughs> So it really is like building this safety net and this fun safety net at Disney World for five days that's all provided by my listeners. They do everything. Bert is going on his own big adventure next year. He's marrying his girlfriend of five years, Tiffany Haynes. When are you getting married? Well, it's supposed to happen on March 30th, uh, March 20th. Uh, she and I are very flaky. So I've proposed twice now. I know. The first time was... With no ring. No ring. It was just spontaneous. Uh, we were talking about our future, and we literally were sitting in bed. I, I don't even know what we were watching. And the words just came out of my mouth. So let's do it. Let's get married. And she didn't believe me. Uh, it was authentic, but it was spontaneous. Um, and she said yes, with no ring. So we went to Solomon Brothers the next day <laughs> and looked for a ring. Um, then she started designing hers. and. I didn't really want that for her. I didn't want that to be her story. Um, it was very authentic, but I wanted her story to be a little bit more romantic than that. So we were just in um, Maui with the kids and uh, we were taking a tour of the island on a helicopter and it landed in the middle of the island on this mountain. And I wasn't really sure where and when I was gonna do it when we went to Hawaii, but this helicopter lands, she gets off and she takes one look around and she starts crying and I'm like, this is it. So I got down on one knee and did it, did it the right way this time. <laughs> yes again. A yes again. And the kids were there. Yeah, Hollis was uh, filming it. It's funny because you can hear, he's so stressed out getting the shot right. Uh, as I'm proposing, all you can hear is him going, ah, 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 just breathing heavy over the proposal. And uh, Eliza, Tiffany's seven-year-old, was snapping pictures. So it was kind of a family thing. It was really cool. I was not expecting that. Oh, my God. Wow. And I understand you've become a girl daddy now. Man, she got me racks. Wow. Anything she wants. I mean, it's 730 at night, and I'm not even thinking anymore. And she comes in wanting to put makeup on my face, and I'm like... <laughs> Here we go. I mean, it's just done. So when you look at your boys, and now it's soon to be, she is your daughter. Yeah. What is it you want for them? Happiness, period. That's easy. That's the easiest question you threw at me today. Um, happiness. It's not my definition. I just feel like if they're happy, I don't care what they're doing, you know? Um, if you ask me about my son Hayden right now, that dude right now, I think I would say could win an Academy Award being uh, a screenwriter. He could also be a manager at Publix and be totally happy. I don't care which one he becomes, so long as he can really truly look at himself in the mirror and say, this is my idea of happiness, I don't care what he does. It is, I don't want him to be in radio, I don't want him to be in movies, I have no expectation, the only thing I truly want for them is to be happy. That's it. And they have their own definition for that.
My next guest loves to make people laugh. Whether she's doing stand-up in a club, working on radio, or writing for shows like Meet the Browns. I go one-on-one -on -one with comic Myra J to learn how she went from social work to social humor. You get what you pay for when you fly these little cheap airlines. You know that, right? Yes. Get what you pay for, absolutely. I was on a dog on plane, was so cheap. Flight attendant said, last one in, close the door. <laughs> Do you write your stuff out? Or does it just come natural? I, I have to write it out. Oh, oh yeah, Ev everything, everything is written. They passed out the peanuts. I opened up the bag of peanuts, shook them in my hand. She said, what you think you're doing? You take one, you pass the rest back. The, the beauty of it is when we go, well, for me, when I go on stage, it should feel like I'm just thinking of it. It's like a conversation. It's like, girl, I'm just going to talk to you. I've been working on that joke for three months, but, but I would never know it. You, you don't have to know that. You don't have to know that. You just need to, to feel like we're sharing a moment. Laughter is one of the greatest gifts. Just like you're smiling now, it just went straight to my heart, like boom because it's, it's a give and take. So how would you describe the comedy that you do? Observational or what? Yes, it, it's very uh, observational and what I've experienced. Um, I'm, I'm not so, so much a joke teller as I am a story teller. I do things, you, women go in and get mammograms, like all oh, this. I get a mammogram, my mind has gone in 9,000 different directions. Like, that is not a mammogram. That's a panini machine right there. I mean, that's just where my mind goes. So, so for, for me, it always goes to that extreme. Like, okay, you call that what that is, but my mind is saying something totally, totally different all the time. And I've always been like that. Is there any subject you will not touch? Not yet. <laughs> not not yet. Uh, and and I used to be I used to be let's say much, much more tentative. But I think as we just mature as people, as, as women, we get that two drops in the bucket attitude. Like, what are you waiting for? What are you saving it for? Why are you afraid? Live your life. Live your life is short. Life is short, so, so if not now, when? Just go ahead and say it. Everybody isn't going to like you. That's okay. Do you like yourself? It's been hot. That thing has been hot. Like the Lord got something to prove. Hell, it is hot. I went to pay for something to prove. Somebody out my bra, George Washington, and pulled his wig off. What the hell? How do you know when a joke is really good and when it flops? Oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> and how do you handle it? <laughs> you, you know, um, for, for me at, as a comic, as you learn to, to work the crowd and stuff, being on stage, I have learned to work my voice. And, and as the crowd is, you know, laughing, I like to lower my voice and get very, very soft and talk like this, because then I notice the crowd comes down. And when you can hear a butterfly just pee on cotton, and the place is so quiet, in my mind I'm thinking, I got them. I can take this audience anywhere I want to go. Then there are times you tell a joke and you say, and da da da, and again, you hear a butterfly pee on cotton, and that's when you don't, <laughs> you thought you was gonna get some jokes and some laughs, and nothing happens, and you just have to brush it off and keep on going. When One on One continues, how a date's dare took her from social worker to comedian. It was like 12 white guys performing, and I was like, they were all right, but I'm as funny as them. He said, if you think you're funny, every Monday night is open mic. I didn't even know what that meant. 48 hours later, I went on stage for the first time ever. Look at this crowd right here. That's my people right here. I just see the pre-existing conditions all in the room. Look at us. Ain't nothing up in here but social security, disability, and retirement. You know what tickles me about you, and I love finding out about you. You're a woman who has a bachelor's degree in communications. Mm -hmm. 
and then you've got a master's degree in education. You were a social worker, and then you became a comedian because of a blind date. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that part. Okay, just a little bit of history. I was voted most humorous female of my senior class. Yes, ma'am. So I've, I've always had that, that little, I, I call it my little Ferris Bueller day off, kind of part to me where I was always doing something and never getting caught. I went into social services because back in the day, as you well know, for particularly minority women, even if you were going to be a professional, you were going to be a school teacher, a social worker, a librarian, a secretary, blah, blah, blah. I went to college, okay. Nobody encouraged me to write. No one encouraged me to, to do comedy. So I became a social worker. And working at the unemployment, well, it's the employment office, but we always said the unemployment office. A guy said, you want to go to, to a comedy club? I love comedy. I love Mama's Maybe. I had never been to a comedy club in LA. Went to, to a comedy club on a Saturday night, and I kid you not, at the, the end of the night, he said, well, and how was it? it was like 12 white guys performing. And I said, well, they were all right, but I'm as funny as them. He said, no, these, these are professionals. If you think you're funny, every Monday night is open mic. I didn't even know what that meant. That was on Saturday. 48 hours later, I went on stage for the first time ever to perform comedy. She took a friend from her poetry club with her for support, and that night, talent scouts were there who liked her work, but... They said, you're funny, but you don't look like a black comedian and we don't know what to do with you. Wait a minute. Yes, yes they did. And, and, I, and, and I will never forget it because the comedy, the quote unquote sitcoms at that time was, that's my mama, what's happening, good times. I knew exactly what they were saying to me. You're not dark skinned, you're not heavy set. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but you don't pigeonhole us like that. And when they said that to me, I was like, I'm getting ready to be a stand-up comic. Just because they said, we don't know what to do with you. But comedian Robin Harris, famous for Bebe's kids in the movie House Party, knew what to do with her after seeing her perform while the band took a break at a club. When I finished, th this guy came over and said, wow, you're really funny. I'm a comic too. And I'm like, okay. He said, my name is Robin Harris. That's how I, I met Robin. But the funniest part to me from that night was he said, Get in your car, follow me. Okay, fine. I follow him to, to this spot. It was somewhere near the 405 freeway in, in Los Angeles. And it was one of those nights where they would give, give us a room to, to dance and party. And we walked in this little tiny room, the dance floor is packed. And the DJ, I will never forget this, stopped the music and said, Robin Harris is in the house. And they stopped the music and I'm like, Oh, we gonna get our ass kicked now. <laughs> you gonna stop the music on a bunch of damn black folks dancing in the middle of the floor? Stop the music and Robin walked over to, they didn't even have a stage, to where the guy was DJing at the little DJ podium with that stationary mic and stood there and started firing off jokes. I had never seen anything like it in my life. And the people were rolling, rolling. And I stood there in awe like, oh, he's a comedian. He's a real comedian, and that's how our friendship started. What's the best advice he ever gave you about being a comic? Quit my day job. <laughs> he was the reason, I was so scared to quit. Well, you know what, it, it was different, especially it was so different for women. Because most of the guys that I met who were comics, they, they were in a relationship and the woman was working, so they could, could do their thing. Or it was like six of them living in an apartment with, with no furniture, you know. I was a single mom, and that was my number one priority. So I still had to go, uh, and I had to clean house, I had to do homework, I had, I went into the club so many times smelling like pine saw, because I done mopped the floor before I had to come, come down there, and I couldn't hang out and lollygag afterwards because I dropped my son off with one of my girlfriends, so I have to go and pick, pick my kid up as soon as I could come off stage and be a mom. And I do remember Robin said, Myra, you, you're gonna have to just, just quit, just jump in with both feet, and I was scared to that because he worked at Bank of America 
as a, a clerk or something, but he, he quit. And, and when he quit, things just started to take off and he said, you gotta do it. Whew, you call about stepping out on faith? Pinch yourself a couple of times? Yeah, well, you, you know what? I, when, I, when I quit, I, I quit social services. I got the opportunity to manage an apartment building in Beverly Hills. And they said all I had to do was come up with $200 a month to cover utilities. And I'm like, well, if I can't come up with $200 a month, I don't need to be a comedian. And, and that's how I ended up leaving social services because the guy was like, you ever manage an apartment building? Nope, but I can do it. And that's, that was the big flip. I never worked a nine to five ever again. I started looking around and found out, you do a lot of public speaking with young people. Why? Because I feel as though we have to give them hope. We have to give them an encouragement. I think coming up when, when I did, when, when we did, it wasn't a lot of people that looked like us to give us encouragement. One of the stories that I tell people, I, I, got, a, I got a master's degree. I have a master's degree. When I went, I needed a car. I had got a job in Los Angeles. Buses were on strike. I needed to teach a class out in Chino Prison, which was a good 35 miles away. This was on a set, got the job on Friday. I was supposed to start on Monday. I knew I didn't have a car. I went into the, back then it was the Datsun dealership. <laughs> remember yeah, that? I remember Datsuns. Yes. And, and I'm sitting there and the guy isn't paying much attention to me. I'm just like, I need a car, I need a car. And I sat there and finally I said to him, I have a master's degree. And the man looked at me like, you have a master's degree? I said, mm-hmm. He said, show me a master's degree. You can pick out a car. I had walked to the, to the dealership. I walked home. I wasn't speaking to my husband at the time, so I didn't tell him what I was doing. I, guess, <laughs> I came home, I got my actual still in the case master's degree. I walked back to the Datsun dealership and I went, sell me a car. And he said, pick out a car. So I picked out the cheapest one on the lot and I picked out this blue, I still see it. It was a blue Datsun B210. It was a manual. I did not know how to drive a manual. When I got in the car, I asked the man, what's that extra pedal down there on the floor for? <laughs> so, it's a stick shift, what that mean? <laughs> yeah, so I literally, I had to call my husband at the time to actually come to the dealership to drive it off the lot. But that's how I got the car so I can get to work the next day. And I share that story with students because I'm like, you never know what door will open when you have an education. So who makes Myra J laugh? Up next, the two comedians who not only crack her up, but teach her something in the process. Myra J enjoys being back on the road and the stage again, especially with her former Tom Joyner morning show comics, George Wallace and J. Anthony Brown. I'm born raised in Atlanta. You tell me y'all gonna do stupid <laughs> here. Such an Atlanta called College Park. Ain't got no college. <laughs> No <laughs> Who's your favorite comedian, male and then female? My favorite comedian, male, without a doubt, Richard Pryor. Without a doubt, Richard Pryor. Why? Because he was so freaking quick. He was so freaking quick between him and, and probably Dick Gregory, because Dick Gregory was witty. Love Dick Gregory. Uh, right now, female, female it, it's hard for me, but I have to say, I'm really liking Wanda Sykes. Yeah, I like Wanda Sykes a lot. Be because wh where I would like to grow as a comic is not just to make you laugh, but to make you think and laugh. Like, like uh, okay, girl, I saw what you did there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, that's a skill, that's a skill. So you are still honing your craft? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I always, I always want to, to be better. I always want them to, to be more creative. And, and with, the, with just the climate of the world to, today, 
we go on stage to make people laugh, to make people feel better. There is no better feeling than having someone come up to you after the show to say, I wasn't even coming tonight. My friends made, made me come. Or I just lost my mom or my dog just died or whatever it is. And I laughed so hard. Then I'm like, then my work is done and thank you. you know? <laughs> Thanks for watching. Hope you'll join me next month when I go one-on-one -on -one with voice coach Mama Jan Smith, the woman behind superstars like Justin Bieber and Usher. How she knew from the beginning that they were stars in the making. Justin was the real deal, and nobody screamed when he came in or left the building, you know? He was just a kid, but his true charisma, his chutzpah, was all there. Plus, he's a Grammy-nominated gospel singer, songwriter, and pastor. Marvin Sapp opens up about overcoming his troubled past and where he draws his inspiration from. And it's the untold story of a mother's resilience and courage. I sit down with the actress portraying Mamie Till and her pursuit of justice for her 14-year-old son in the movie Till. Join me October 23rd at 8 p.m. For the next Monica Pearson one-on-one. -on -one.